Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Diane Fodell. Thank you for joining our Cognitive Systems Institute um, call today, our speaker series. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Chow Lin Andy Lee, um, who will present Cognitive Engine Boosting Scientific Discovery. Andy is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Florida. He is directing the Scalable Software Systems Laboratory, S3 Lab. S3 Lab. And the mission of the S3 Lab is to create future cloud, smart life, and big data ecosystems with intelligence today. Um, Dr. Lee has published over 90 peer-reviewed papers and journals and conference procedures, four books and four patents. He has a number of credentials I will post in the chat. Um, so I don't take up any more time. Let me introduce Andy and uh, have you take over the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for the um, introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation to give a talk, to share some experience. Um, uh, we are uh, doing here. Yeah, so, yeah, good morning to everyone. Um, so I'm going to present uh, Cognitive Engine, but it's actually it's a, it's a whole um, landscape of my past few years of uh, efforts at UF. So before we dive into the details, let's see uh, the actually the, the long history or short history of uh, information technology. Uh, in 1939, the modern digital computer was created by John Atanasov, and actually uh, he was an alumni uh, graduate from our department in 1925. The first computer was called ABC. Uh, after that, we have uh, a little bit more famous, famous uh, ANAC in 1946. So that started this, uh, uh, I call this, so this uh, John's computer, including John Bonaman. And in, uh, inventors ANIAC and uh, inventors ABC, all these John computers. So that started with the computing age, so computing uh, era. So with the, the first uh, couple of decades, uh, the, the progress was uh, relatively slower. But after uh, 1970s, and so we go through these uh, milestones, the turning point that's closer to make computing closer to the life, uh, to, to normal people, to, uh, to populate the large populations. So 1979, we have this uh, yeah, internet uh, or uh, Arpanet. Then 1980s, we saw PC, like uh, this is IBM PC. <coughs> then 1990s, we have this World Wide Web and uh, Web Browser. So that introduced all kinds of uh, new things, new possibilities for uh, for normal user to access information uh, worldwide. In the meantime, we see. Andy, in the meantime, we have a little, to, yeah. There's a little bit of a background noise and echo. Um, I muted the lines, yeah. but I'm not sure if, uh, everybody was Thank muted. You, but it, can I just? audience to please mute your telephones or mute your computer um, when, until it's time for questions and answers. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, they reached. so after we have this World Wide Web, actually the computing is really close to uh, normal people. Then, in the meantime, we have seen this uh, <clears throat> a fourth generation of uh, mobile computing. Um, again, this iPhone uh, actually made this uh, phone really smart. Although before that, there are lots of smartphones, but uh, that's the turning point. Uh, so your grandma can use it. That's, that's uh, opened a new age. So then with this new age coming, we, we have seen this uh, cloud computing uh, uh, sort of uh, sweep through the, the industry. And uh, another interesting thing is <coughs> the network. So as, as we just mentioned, uh, in 1970, we have TCP IP internet was there uh, for a long time, but until uh, like the 90s, uh, like National Information Highway, uh, all these uh, government-supported uh, information highway uh, and backbone 
built up, then we see all this uh, uh, booming of uh, IT. So, uh, but after so many years, like 30, 40 years, um, there's no much change, uh, no fundamental change until recently. The uh, it's so-called software-defined networking uh, SDN. So that's um, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, we will we will we will talk about it later again. But I was mentioning this because I want to see what is the turning point. What is the milestone that actually made the dramatic change to IT to computing? Uh, this uh, history. So in 2013, just recently, um, so this Internet to uh, Innovation Platform has been deployed uh, across many uh, universities across the country. So we have computing, we have uh, networking. Uh, what is missing is the intelligence. So uh, unfortunately, uh, deep learning uh, actually has, people have been working on this neural network for, for many decades. But uh, even deep learning was proposed uh, uh, around uh, early 2000, 2006. So, but until uh, some major breakthrough or major events, uh, uh, that made uh, the uh, top 10 breakthrough uh, in uh, MIT technology review. So the, these are the uh, key players. <clears throat> so we have seen uh, these uh, computing, networking, and intelligence. Also all combined together, uh, we, are, we are, in my opinion, it's a purely a personal um, uh, wish is to, we are going towards the intelligent platform. So in the history, we can see, I call this uh, two decades, 2D IT booming cycle, uh, two decades, uh, 2D, uh, and there, I will say another 3D, uh, three decades. Uh, so. Uh, the IT booming version one is like uh, PC, that's the IBM, IBM PC, IBM competitive PC. That made this computing to the personal PC, uh, it's a personal computing. And uh, booming two, version two is the dot com, uh, dot com booming and uh, burst as well. But the, then the current is actually we are going through the version three of this IT booming. Um, it's, uh, so the job market is super good. Uh, so for my students, it's, it's not so good for the professors, but uh, I still allow them to see my students uh, successful in either academia and industry. Um, so there's another three decades, every three decades computing platform cycles from uh, the early time, the mainframe. Again, IBM played uh, leading roles in many of uh, these milestones. And the second stage is the um, PC uh, kind of server computing model. Now the current is a, we call it a third, uh, third computing platform. Uh, it's cloud, mobile, uh, social network, uh, and even big data. So what is the fourth platform? Um, so that's, uh, I, uh, that's my bet. Um, maybe some people will say it's quantum computing, but we haven't. I haven't seen um, it's, uh, how, how promising, which one is uh, either quantum or intelligent. So my bet is on intelligent computing platform. So we will see another version of Boomi uh, as uh, even beyond my imagination for now, uh, so after another 20 years. So that's the landscape we, uh, we have seen, and uh, that's uh, my uh, personal uh, understanding of the the whole uh, uh, industry landscape. So accordingly, what we uh, we should do as a professor uh, at the university. So uh, as we see, uh, that's uh, so we have seen all these uh, things going. Uh, so my background from HTC, uh, cloud, and a big data. So I've been teaching all these uh, classes uh, and doing research for. Uh, 10 years on in this, all, all these three areas. But uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, at least on campus, uh, I think industry has uh, more, uh, more flexibility. So campus, we have all these uh, resources, uh, HP center, we have supercomputer centers, but majority, uh, at least at UF and many other schools, all these three clusters are partitioned and they cannot exchange. If one cluster is, um, idle, you cannot use it, basically. 
Uh, so what we want to do is to unify, uh, we call this unified big system to accommodate all these three and the resources can flow around and jobs and uh, task workloads can flow around all these three uh, seamlessly. So that's our effort, oh sorry, we call Like, yeah, PowerPoint is uh, sorry. So we uh, to unify this uh, company platform, uh, we build this uh, Gita Cloud. Uh, so we call this software-defined ecosystem, including software-defined networking uh, and software-defined computing. And using uh, these uh, application where uh, to drive the network, using data to drive the network, using data to drive the computing uh, resources to support the applications on campus. So we deployed uh, the 100 gig uh, Aspen uh, switch and the networks across the campus uh, across many dozens of data centers and supercomputer centers. Uh, we deployed in 2012, and it was, it was one of the first uh, fast, uh, 100 gig SDN campus solution network. And we have, at the US, we have this hypergate supercomputer, and uh, so it, uh, it was uh, ranked in top 500, um, pretty powerful, uh, more than uh, more than one, uh, let me say more than 100k cores now, and uh, lots of CPUs and FPGAs. So we have seen this um, uh, dramatic change on computing, networking, and even intelligence. Um, but uh, intelligence is still ongoing, uh, so that's our current kind of focus. Um, so we have seen computing change so much, and uh, uh, life science, geno genomics change even more dramatic. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know how many times uh, than, uh, more than uh, Moore's law, you can see the curve. Uh, so it's one million times, almost one million times the uh, cost reduction in less than 20 years. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, quite a, very, very surprising. So with all these uh, computing power, with all these uh, new, uh, new technologies uh, for uh, genomics, for uh, DNA sequencing, uh, next generation sequencing uh, uh, algorithms. So we, we've seen all these uh, conference together, and we'll see some even like the um, uh, the CRISPR Cas9 for uh, gene uh, uh, editing. All these uh, technology, if if we can leverage and integrate these uh, cutting edge technology together, we'll see a very huge uh, improvement and the transformation uh, across this uh, uh, display. So uh, deep learning alone uh, from 2006, uh, so the, uh, the major event after 2006 is the uh, AlexNet in 2012, uh, and later on you see uh, VGGNet, GoogleNet, and RedNet. <coughs> So that's <clears throat> so-called. Uh, I think I copied slides from uh, from the, uh, the authors of RedNet. Um, it, they call this a revolution, a revolution of death. So it's a so make it this uh, deeper and deeper. Um, even go up to uh, 152 layers. Uh, they even tried uh, 1,000 layers. Uh, so this a deeper understanding, uh, or deeper abstraction of the problem domain. Uh, actually, it's very powerful. As you can see, it's actually uh, surpassed uh, human uh, recognition uh, uh, accuracy. So all these uh, is based on <coughs> uh, based on these um, uh, uh, kind of uh, hypothesis uh, for intelligence. So according to um, uh, I think uh, according to the author of intelligence, uh, so. 
the hypothesis is <clears throat> for our uh, new cortex is there's one learning algorithm, and this algorithm is uh, very interesting. Uh, it's applied to all kinds of uh, uh, your uh, perception, uh, 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 vision, hearing, touching. All these input patterns from all different senses sensors are actually equivalent to a new cortex. And another interesting thing is the thinking, predicting, and doing, they are actually uh, intertwined and uh, in sequence and hierarchically uh, intertwined. So you, you do by predicting, uh, you think by predicting. Uh, it's, uh, so that this kind of uh, interesting observation about uh, human intelligence actually uh, 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 used in different in many ways. So uh, with this kind of understanding, uh, we uh, build this uh, cognitive engine. Uh, so the first version current uh, is, is based on Spark, uh, but we uh, we see the uh, constraint of Spark. Uh, they use this uh, bulky synchronization parallelism. So uh, the, the, the problem is the uh, too much synchronization cost, particularly for deep learning. Uh, there are lots of uh, synchronization for each uh, uh, iteration and epoch, so uh, for so many layers. So it's uh, very costly. Uh, so on the left is the Hadoop style, like map and shuffle and synchronize and reduce. So on the right is the Spark way. Is, uh, uh, so you have a smooth synchronization stage. Uh, smaller, so it's uh, it's, uh, it's better um, and in memory, uh, so that uh, but it's still not sufficient uh, uh, for uh, deep learning. So then we actually create a, a, another uh, abstraction we call this uh, ADD. So Spark has this uh, RDD, so we call this uh, asynchronous attribute data set. So we borrow the uh, easy to use or uh, user-friendly program interface of Spark, but we change the underlying uh, Spark uh, internals. And we separate the data, and uh, so static data and, and uh, dynamic data. And we make these asynchronous updates automatic. And uh, you can have a bound. This bound can be a threshold, it can be a, a function, and uh, make this uh, asynchronous uh, scheduling um, uh, for the particularly for deep learning, so this is ADD. Uh, so basically, we have training samples of static data input to uh, the clients. They they get a, a part of this uh, data to process it. Uh, so this kind of a data uh, paradigm. But later on, in this uh, after you process some data, so the data will. They update the parameters, the model will be pushed to the ADD server. ADD server is like parameter servers, uh, partially. Then, uh, this update data, uh, update the model, uh, will be used to, to uh, will be used by other clients. Right? Then, during this feed forward and the back propagation process, this model will be, uh, uh kept updating. And, uh, in this way, we can avoid uh, synchronization. Uh, we can, because the, uh, particularly for uh, SCD, stochastic gradient descent, so ADD is very suitable for uh, SCD based uh, uh, deep learning. So uh, we can actually, so some client can work at multiple staff uh, without waiting for other clients. So we leverage these um, particular features in deep learning. So then when you execute, so AD task, it, it looks like a Spark task. So we have our own scheduler, the scheduler task to, to the resources, and this, uh, this client will fetch data, fetch parameters, and process it, update the parameters, and uh, they are book, bookkeeping to keep this model. So we can accommodate both the data parallelism and, and the model parallelism as well. So there are lots of advantage, uh, particularly this, uh, uh, the major feature is the asynchronous uh, update, and we can keep IO and CP overlapped. And we also have uh, this uh, for torrent, and we uh, derive and live with the uh, Spark, so we can leverage the 
Spark user base, and we can leverage uh, other uh, packages on top of Spark. And in, in the meantime, we can also uh, maximize the parallelism of GPUs without uh, uh, kind of waiting, a GPU waiting for CPU. That is very um, uh, costly. So based on this, and so our focus, uh, our research is uh, one is on systems, the other is on the applications. Uh, so we call it deep apps. Uh, deep science, uh, deep sky, so including computer science, deep uh, defense for the DDoS defense. And another uh, major focus is the deep health. Uh, so we have done some uh, bipolar detection and some uh, sepsis detection and uh, cancer, cancer uh, cell uh, image uh, detection. And we are building a, a robot, we call it a uh, deep robot, deep bot. And we are attempting even to do uh, uh, drug discovery uh, using deep bot, but that's just uh, started. So Deep Sky is uh, to find uh, a new planet uh, uh, to help the astronomers to figure out whether the data has uh, a new planet or not. So one is the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey. They collect lots of data, uh, and uh, they they call this bump. Uh, there's a 2175A bump. So that's kind of a pattern you want to detect so that uh, you can you you can I mean uh, astronomers they can understand that's a that's a, a new new planet. So basically, uh, so that's a reference on the back background. Uh, the telescope will look at a star, and uh, but then you, they use equation to solve this problem. Uh, instead of equations, we use a deep neural network and mainly convolutional neural network and uh, LSTM to solve it. And uh, so uh, these are the features, and we also use this uh, reconstruction to understand whether the input has bump or not to make sure we really see uh, the data rather than uh, just a black box. We also tried uh, uh, data detection use uh, deep, uh, deep, uh, deep learning, we call it deep defense. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a multi-level uh, deeper layers of LSTM and the plus are uh, coming up. So for deep health, uh, so it's a data driven. Uh, so we did uh, this bipolar disorder detection. Uh, we actually want a challenge. We don't really know too much about genomics. Uh, so basically, we did, do the data pre-processing and uh, try the two version. One is the convolution neural network. The other is the convolution autoencoder. The problem, uh, the challenge of this data is that it has huge dimensions, 500k dimensions, but only 1,000 data. So it's a very small data compared to 500. Thousand dimensions, so we use this conversion autoencoder to dramatically reduce the dimension, so that we can. Uh, we actually are working on to how to trace back to find the mutated uh, genes that actually that uh, that are most effective uh, to treat uh, bipolar disorder. So we are building a deep cloud, uh, so multiple cloud engine uh, uh, on multi-tenant, uh, multi-services applications. Platform, so that that's a deep cloud. So uh, as a summary, uh, so we have done some uh, interesting things in the last uh, few years. We built the smartphone indoor localization or indoor GPS. Uh, we call it uh, indoor GPS with uh, five centimeters uh, of accuracy. It, it's uh, one of the finest uh, indoor GPS. And uh, we build this, uh, we deploy this campus research network, and we build this uh, team. Uh, we claim this is the first testing enabled campus cloud, Kata Cloud, and we wish we to build uh, one of the first uh, fourth computing platform uh, we call Deep Cloud. So, so two part of uh, our research is one is deep learning, big data, and cloud. The other is uh, mobile social network, uh, mobile platforms. Uh, we have lots of fun devices uh, in, in a lab, and we have lots of computing power. So, uh, sorry, why is it so? There's too many animations.
Yeah, we are also planning uh, another IUCNC center for big loan um, still pending. So basically, it's uh, mainly um, large scale deep learning. Uh, it's a consortium of uh, five universities and uh, a large number of industry partners. Yeah, so we also have, uh, I would thank uh, IBM uh, support. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption of this uh, PowerPoint uh, crash. Thank you, thank you, Andy. That was that was a really good overview of of the work in your laboratory. Um, let me open it for questions right now. Uh, press star one to ask a question. So, so I'll, I'll ask a question. A Andy, it looks like this deep um, cloud and deep learning has a lot of different applications, um, you know, especially in healthcare. It, are you working with um, medical uh, facilities or medical institutions on, on the things, you know, for, for deep health? Yes, uh, we, we are working with the doctors. In, we have a, a medical school. Uh, we have a school of pharmacy. We have a school of uh, medicine. So we are working with some chiropractors in, in, their, uh, in pharmacy and uh, medicine. Yeah, and, and so um, ju just on the bipolar, uh, w yeah. what is the input for that? It's it's exome sequencing. Yes, it's the uh, the input is uh, uh, one thousand samples. Each sample has uh, five hundred dimensions of uh, data items. Uh, so each item is basically a uh, genotype. Uh, like uh, either this genotype is uh, explicit, is active or not, is passive or, or active. Uh, so, like, uh, uh, so for example, uh, like uh, parents. So father has uh, black hair, uh, mother has uh, brown hair. Then what is the hair color for children? So maybe brown is uh, passive, then black is. Uh, uh, it's active, then the children will have black hair. So this kind of uh, genotype. So that's the information we given. Uh, we are given. So one genotype plus one kind of um, uh, either passive or active or, or not non, uh, not known unknown. Then uh, with the samples, the 500 samples uh, labeled as uh, uh, yeah about 500 labeled as uh, with the Bio, uh, bipolar disorder, the other half uh, uh, without uh, bipolar, uh, bi uh, bipolar disorder. So then we need to predict. So we use a half for training, half for testing to predict uh, accurate. Then they, will, they have another testing. Uh, in, in, so this is a competition. So uh, Berkeley people, they will provide the testing. Then we, to rank the, all the accuracy uh, of the proposals. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Um, are there Thank any you. questions it's, for it's, Andy? I'm sorry. No, this, this kind of data is quite a typical. Uh, this uh, is quite. I actually talked to many doctors. They said this kind of data is very typical for doctors, and also for uh, like ICU. Uh, so we have a, a match R1 grant. Uh, so it's to do this real-time uh, diagnosis and a risk assessment uh, of a patient in ICU in uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, testing. So uh, doctors they have they make uh, recommendations, but those are sort of labeled data to us. But those uh, inputs are very limited. Majority of data actually unlabeled. So we need to figure out a way. Uh, to use the limited information and the limited knowledge uh, di distilled from doctors, then to infer these patients' condition. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Well, um, I'm afraid our time is up, but thank you so much for being our presenter today. And to the audience, um, I do not have a speaker lined up for next week, May 5th. It, it, so if you would like to make a presentation that day, please get with me. Um, send me an email. Um, 
And I thank you for your uh, for attending today, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye now.